one of the set texts for this term is also spoke Zarathustra, or thus spoke Zarathustra, by um, Friedrich Nietzsche. It's a very, very difficult book. They're hard to understand and quite intimidating. So I thought I'd make a few observations to uh, help us all on our way. Um, this is not a simple, straightforward, realist novel like Emil Zola, uh, who we were reading earlier on. It's much more like James Joyce, very fragmented, um, a sort of book that really you can pick up and dip into uh, each chapter. Nietzsche himself, in his other writings, described it as a well that you could go and dip into this book from time to time, get something out of it. And that's really the best way to use it. Um, it consists of these somewhat disjointed um, parables, because uh, part of the style, it's rather like the Bible. It's like, a, it's like creating a dense religious text. Now, overall, it has meta-meanings that can be derived and if you read the textbook, Bertrand Russell on Nietzsche, um, Russell talks about some of these themes and theories that are in Zarathustra in the context of Nietzsche's work as a whole. Bertrand Russell, of course, is very hostile uh, to Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, and perhaps we can get into that. But in this talk, I want to stay pretty close to the text of um, Zarathustra. Uh, and try and point you towards uh, some of its meaning and some of its importance. Astra was an ancient Persian uh, religious figure, the founder of the Zoroastrian religion. Uh, it's now virtually extinct. Um, there's probably a few hundred thousand Zoroastrians they mainly live now in India, where they're known as the Farsis, Farsi being the, the word for the Iranian language, because uh, Zoroaster originally came from Iran. Um, the Farsis are mainly known for their funeral rites, which involves leaving the dead body on top of a huge pillar uh, so that birds can come and uh, pick the corpse. Anyway. Zoroaster was a real historical figure as far as we can tell, uh, and he founded the religion of Zoroastrianism. Uh, the, the, the central point about Zoroastrianism is it divides the universe into a duality of good and evil. That the, There is a dialectic of history in Zoroastrianism um, of an epic battle between the forces of good uh, and the forces of evil. Uh, and uh, Nietzsche is very, very interested in that. He's partly interested in it because it's an extinct religion, and it's, an, it's a religion from the 6th century BC, so it's very old. It predates Christianity by, well, in, in Nietzsche's terms, because Nietzsche doesn't date Christianity from, from Jesus necessarily, so it's, a, it, it's almost a thousand years older than Christianity. Um, but also, importantly for Nietzsche, Zoroaster and Zoroastrianism was before Socrates. It was before the ancient Greeks. It was, it was contemporary with the, with the very early days of, of the Greeks. Uh, and its religious system of Zoroastrianism was settled uh, long before um, the age in which Socrates was, was teaching. And this is very significant. The Nietzsche is full of hate. He thinks that hate is a good thing. He thinks it's a powerful, honest emotion. And he hates many, many things. Uh, one of which is Christianity. Another of which is Socrates. Uh, in Zarathustra, you will see the chapter there on the hour of the great contempt. He says the, the greatest thing in life the speak Zarathustra, according to Zarathustra, is when you're hating, when you when you when you um, embrace what he calls the great contempt. Um, this is the the most enjoyable thing. Uh, and I have to say, as a football fan, uh, I think that's true. When I go and watch my team, I'm not particularly 
interested in them winning. I'm more interested in hating the people there again. So I, I think that there's a, you know, the psychology of Nietzsche is very true. Um, but you can't say that kind of thing in polite Christian society where all hate is bad and all love is good. Uh, one of Nietzsche's points is he wants to reverse that. He thinks love, compassion, softness, gentleness, these kind of things that in our Christian culture and our Socratic culture are held up to be great, are in fact bad things. Um, they are a source of war, uh, of doom, of all kinds of problems. And we need to get back to a realisation that contempt uh, for mediocrity, contempt for injustice, contempt for mental sloth are bad things which need to be uh, struggled against. So it's relatively easy to see that Nietzsche would be against uh, Christianity which, by the way, he sees as simply a, a, a sub-cult of Judaism, uh, because at the centre of Christianity, his principal doctrine really is love your enemy, turn the other cheek, suffering is good in this world, um, the reward is in the next world, you should deny the pleasures of the flesh. You, he thinks of it, he calls um, thinly disguised in, in Zarathustra, it's what he calls the preachers of death. And these are Christians, that they, uh, they're they obsessed with dying. They want to die. Christianity is a religion where you aim to die. Uh, you deny the natural impulses of, of life. Um, but why is he against uh, Socrates? Uh, this is slightly more obscure because I... I suppose students will be less familiar with uh, the ancient Greeks than they are with um, Christianity. Uh, now, but most people will have heard of Socrates and the Socratic method, which is constant questioning of uh, any knowledge, a kind of all-pervading scepticism. Uh, Socrates famously says, the more I learn, the less I know. There are more questions than answers, and that it's really impossible to know anything in this world. Um, in Socrates' dialogues, uh, recorded by Plato, Plato goes on to construct a whole world of uh, uh, a kind of afterlife, uh, an eternal, ideal world that's like heaven. And from a Nietzschean perspective, Christianity is essentially just a religi religified version of Plato's philosophical idealism, and that's derived from Socrates, and that's where it all went terribly wrong. It's been all downhill in uh, Western culture for Nietzsche, really, since um, the 4th century BC. Uh, he thinks the people who had it all right were the so-called pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, um, people like uh, the Epicureans, who uh, had a, a morality based entirely on uh, enjoyment, physical enjoyment of this life, of embrace of the sensations and possibilities of this life. They were not otherworldly at all. Uh, Nietzsche's job was as a philologist looking at uh, ancient Greek texts. Now he was working in the, towards the end of the 19th century and this was a great age of rediscovery of pre-Socratic uh, Greek texts which um, perhaps to some extent have been suppressed during the Middle Ages and during the, the age of Plato, the age of uh, Aristotle. And he found in these texts and particularly in the pre-Socratic tradition of tragedy, um, what he believed to be a much more healthy outlook. So he's going way back to the 6th century BC to Zoroaster. So, because here is a man, Zoroaster, who would not be bound in any way by the moralism, um, the death, 
worship of uh, Socratic and Christian moral systems. I mean, this is how Nietzsche sees it. Obviously, the Christians would reject some of this. In fact, there's quite a Christian backlash against Nietzsche. It mainly takes the form of consequentialism. Um, it's often said of Nietzsche that if you dispose of the um, morality both of uh, ancient classical Greece and Christianity, then you descend into a kind of nihilism. And what uh, has been done to poor old Frederick Nietzsche is he's been forever associated with the Nazis. Um, this is not really fair. I think it's true that the early 20th century fascist movement was inspired to some extent by Friedrich Nietzsche's idea of the ideas of elitism. Um, Nietzsche is a great advocate of uh, aristocracy, of elitism. He's trenchantly anti-democratic. He thinks democracy is a, an appalling thing that could lead, that will lead to wars and um, and kind of ultimately the the disintegration of uh, of everything that's noble and good in Western civilization. Uh, maybe come back to that. I mean, if you read the the Bertrand Russell chapter, that that's basically Russell's uh, description of it. Uh, but it's and the Nazis certainly waved Friedrich Nietzsche about uh, as part of the kind of stupid uh, witch's brew of rubbish that uh, passed for the official ideology of Nazism. You know, there's a bit of everything in there. Um, so it's a bit unfair. Nietzsche was long dead by that time. So it's a bit unfair to pin that on him. And I think that the Christians they have, um, have played a role in that. You say, you know, Frederick Nietzsche, that terrible man, who incidentally, you know, <laughs> by coincidence, is the person who, who, who provides this devastating uh, assault attack on Christianity. They say, oh, that guy, he was a Nazi. But there's, uh, there's no, I mean, I think that's basically, I'll put my cards on the table. I think that that's, unfair and, and at the very least the, the situation the relationship of Nietzsche to Nazism uh, is uh, much more complicated the, the, the terrifying thing for me anyway about Nazism is how much it's within the mainstream of uh, European uh, cultural development uh, and there's this kind of post-Nazi idea that um, that everybody went insane or they were hypnotized by Nietzsche and they were hypnotized by Hitler and they all became Nazis temporarily and then we came back to uh, the lovely world of uh, Christian peace and love. I, I mean I don't accept that at all about Nietzsche uh, and, and neither does Russell. He, he concedes that uh, Nietzsche w was not a racist uh, in any way. That would be completely contrary to Nietzsche's individualism. Nietzsche, one of his great contempts is for any type of herd behaviour, any group behaviour. This is part, of, on the one hand, of his anti-democratic approach, but uh, any kind of nationalism or the, the submergence of the individual will into uh, an abstract entity such as the German nation or the English nation, that is utterly foreign to uh, Nietzsche's approach. So I suppose you could say he's a non-racist fascist or something, but um, but the straight forward connection that's sometimes made between uh, Nietzsche and the Hitler movement is, is not right. It comes from the Nazis claiming him as a sort of uh, you know intellectual pedigree, but they did the same thing with J.S. Bach and uh, Beethoven and Schiller and Goethe, they claim that all these people were their inspiration, and of course, uh, that's all nonsense. Equally, though, uh, Nietzsche has been claimed by the left, the political left in the 20th century, uh, because of his atheism, uh, his rejection of bourgeois democracy, um, and his revolutionary attack on systems of what Marxists, for example, would call bourgeois morality, which is, in, if we're now talking in Marxist terms, one of the pillars, the buttresses of contemporary capitalist society and the, the capitalist state. 
So he's claimed by everybody he himself would reject association with any of these things, I suspect. Um, he saw himself as one of the aristocratic super people. Um, he had nothing in common with anybody else other than other super people. Um, and trying to get a handle on the connection between Nietzsche and 20th century politics, very difficult. He's really in a category by himself. So let's start looking now in a little more detail at the book, and we'll start with the prologue. So in the book, Zarathustra has been living as a hermit, um, away from other people, away from society. Um, he's a natural man. He worships the sun. He lives with eagles and snakes. Um, he's a natural being. He doesn't see snakes as good or evil, scorpions, the AIDS virus. In his non-moralistic world, all these life forms, I suppose you'd have to say, are, are valid as uh, things in themselves. Their actions, insofar as they're authentic and natural, are equally valid. Uh, man has no special place uh, in the natural world, in the Nietzschean system, uh, except for the fact that he has consciousness. Now the book is very, very densely written right from the start. There's a lot of poetry in here. Uh, part of Nietzsche's method as a philosopher is a method of aphorism, which is he throws out these paradoxical, complex, um, provocative statements. And you're meant to take these and then think about them. So really within every stanza or every paragraph of this book, there's another book within it. Um, and a lot of art writing in the 20th century has been based on this, you know, just getting hold of particular parts of Zarathustra and exploring them more deeply. Um, so it's a well, as he says, it's a resource. It's not, it's, it's, you know, it's a series of provocations. It's also a bit like listening to music. Um, you know, it, it's not something that can be easily understood at the surface level. There's metaphors in here, there are puns. The translation is also difficult. I don't speak German myself, but reading about this, some of this is lost just in the fine degree of punning and wordplay. So one of the phrases constantly used is the going under, the going under. Um, this is a pun, it's like physical death, but it's also like giving in to morality in the German. So it's a very, very difficult uh, text, but we can't ignore it given its uh, very, very great significance on the development of artistic thinking and art writing, as well as philosophy and the general stance towards social science and politics of uh, Nietzsche and his followers in the 20th century. It's not really designed to be understood, it's more like music, and the intention is that the words will provoke in you a subjective, personal, aesthetic, emotional response. And in Nietzsche's systems, some people just won't get it. Um, so he's really trying to speak like Zoroaster to people who are capable, who have sufficient intellectual and aesthetic sensibility and development to be able to get something out of it. Um, now he starts with the metaphor of the man who lives alone in the mountains. He's a mountain man, and, and there's a word play here. He's the overman, the higher man, the man who lives on a higher plane. Literally, he lives in a mountain, and metaphorically, morally, philosophically, he's a man who is not bound by the ordinary rules of mediocre life. He doesn't have to obey the rules. He plays by his own rules. He leaps from mountain top to mountain top. He's not interested in the 
a humdrum way of getting from A to B. He constantly lives in this world of higher thought, of art, of inspiration, of religious passion. You know, he's a, he's a superman. Um, he gains his sensibility by constant self-containment and self-introspection. Um, Zarathustra is the overman. He doesn't depend on others. He's not defined by others. He's not determined by others. He is like the sun. He's like the sun. He illuminates others and is not himself illuminated. Like, and like the sun, he can't help but shine and, and light up the world. Now, people are not going to, some people hide from the sun, they hide in the darkness. There's nothing you can do about that. But the fact that people are hiding in the darkness can't stop him from shining. Um, and when he sets, there's lines there in the prologue, the sun sets in the evening and it brings the underworld. So when Zarathustra is not there, you're in the world of darkness, the undermen, the underworld, uh, and, and so on. And Zarathustra is aching to enlighten people. He's like a bee with too much honey. He needs to give freely this wisdom. Now, this is not Christian charity, but it is the generosity of the noble man. That simply by being close, and it is a man, he, he specifically thinks that women are not capable of being noble and gracious in this sense. It's a shocking thing to be said today, but the, uh, to be said today, but in both Zarathustra and in his other works, he thinks that women are completely inferior beings uh, to men. Um, anyway, but uh, Zoroaster is not a woman. He is a genuinely noble and genuinely charitable man. He gives not because of a moral compunction, but because of a necessity. It's part of his, his greatness. He can only give like the sun. But then he's tired of this. He's tired of shining endlessly like the sun and rather like Jesus. Um, now Nietzsche doesn't like Christianity. But he thinks that Jesus was a, a real historical figure. And he thinks that Jesus was a, a super person in these terms, like Zoroastra. So Zoroastra becomes man, like just as Jesus became man. Um, so it's possible for the super beings to make themselves human and to walk among men to experience things as the undermensch, the ordinary people do. Um, he wants to become, it says there in the text, become like an empty cup. Instead of this endless giving all the time, he wants to be able to receive something or see whether he can receive something. Now, important passages in the book um, concern the last man. And I'm going to take this as a fairly literal reading. Now, the concern here is evolution in Darwinian terms. Now, if you accept Darwinian concept uh, or, or the De Darwinian method, and I mean, it's just ordinary science now. It's so widely accepted. Um, well, when's Nietzsche? Nietzsche's writing 40, 50 years after Darwin began to publish, so he's one generation away from from Darwin. I'm not quite clear that he totally understood the science in Darwin, but some of the points about evolution by terms of natural selection were certainly known to Nietzsche, and they were certainly very widely talked about, uh, almost obsessionally talked about, in the period when Nietzsche is writing Zarathustra. Um, so natural selection. So if we have natural selection for the human race, then you must accept that in due course, the human race will literally but be superseded by a successor species. 
So right now, somewhere in the world, there is another species, perhaps a type of cockroach, perhaps a different type of ape, perhaps some sort of snake, perhaps some sort of eagle, that will evolve and eventually replace humans. Unless humans themselves evolve into some other type of species. So in now then, uh, Stanley Kubrick's be, film, uh, as part of a screen, two thousand and one Space Odyssey, which we're going to view interpretation as a, a viewing as part of a lecture is, series. Um, he illustrates this point by uh, the, the beginning scene, the dawn of man. Uh, he shows a group of apes there. One of the apes gets ahead of the others. Is a sort of super ape. Uh, he invents he, this super ape. Invent, this super ape fashions a deadly weapon out of an animal bone. Uh, that allows him to subjugate all the other apes. I mean, it's amb the film's ambiguous, but it does suggest that this is the first super ape. He subjugates the ordinary apes by means of superior will to power or um, some sort of transcendental elemental life force, which, uh, which um, in Frederick Nietzsche's system, is the motive force both of individual human life and of history. And Nietzsche got this uh, life force idea from Schopenhauer, um, who thought this force was uh, morally evil. Uh, Nietzsche thinks the force is morally good. Um, so here we are in, in the world of popular culture now and sci-fi, and both Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, I think, are huge in 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 sci-fi, uh, I think that uh, in Star Wars, when they're always going about the Force and how it's evil and the power of the Force goes to the dark side, I'm sure that that's Schopenhauer. It's very like Schopenhauer's idea of a universal transcendental force that powers history and it powers human behaviour. It's all encompassing, uh, and um, it's Darth Vader for Schopenhauer, but for Nietzsche. Um, this life force is a is a positive thing. He simply turns Schopenhauer on his head. Schopenhauer. So with with um, with Nietzsche, you've got this Orientalism. You've got interest in the ancient religions of the Middle East of uh, Zoroastrianism. And with Schopenhauer, who um, Nietzsche had read and was inspired by, Schopenhauer essentially was a was a was a Hindu. Um, well, we're talking here about the 19th century, and there's much, much greater European contact, and really for the first time with uh, Asia, with India, because of the spread of the empire. And Schopenhauer got hold of uh, Hinduism. He'd, he'd uh, read the scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, and this idea in Hinduism that life is, um, uh, sorry, that desire, that desire, this constant longing and yearning and wanting which is such a hallmark of the, rom the romantic poetry movement. This yearning, this wanting to know, this wanting for love, this wanting for desire. This is like a great curse for Schopenhauer, but he sees it as a, you know, as the Buddhists do, that this, this egotism, this wanting, this being, is the source of all pain and all misery, and you have to overcome it. Now, uh, Nietzsche really gets hold of this, and he agrees with Schopenhauer that there does seem to be this all-encompassing, wanting, willing, being, will thing. But he thinks uh, you shouldn't turn away from it. You shouldn't try and overcome it. You should embrace it and uh, really inflame your will and uh, really go for it all the time. So in the movie 2001, the super ape has got hold of the will and the will is making him slaughter animals and eat red meat that makes him more powerful and he's able to subjugate, um, uh, subjugate uh, inferior beings to his own will and, and, and shape the world with his, with his, with his own will. Um, this is a very, very different view to the meek and mild world of Christianity, um, as we were saying. But it is the world of Zoroaster and, and the speak Zoroaster, um, Zarathustra, sorry. So then, the first ape, the first, sorry, the super ape is the first human being. Really the first, there must have been in the Darwinian system. It doesn't happen that suddenly one day 
everybody every I'll have to I'll have to put it that way, everybody is a monkey, and then they wake up in the morning and everyone's a human. There must have been you can work this out just by logic, by reason, that one monkey must have gone ahead of the crowd and somehow subjugated them. Uh, and this was a revolutionary um, step forward in evolution. Now, Nietzsche wouldn't have been totally familiar with this, but when you do look at the fossil record, that is in fact how evolution appears to happen. It's not a slow, gradual process. When, we're, when, we, when the word evolution is used metaphorically in everyday speech, it usually, to connote, um, it usually implies the slow change of one thing into another. Uh, but the actual fact of Darwinian evolution is it proceeds by sudden uh, changes, mass extinctions, uh, and sudden emergence of new types of species. So whether Nietzsche knew that, I don't know how much Nietzsche had read of that. I don't know how developed the science of um, uh, evolution was at that time. I'm not really sure about that. I'm sorry about that. I'll have to read up more on it. But um, we now know that uh, this idea is sort of correct, that there, was a, that there must have been a single ape that moved ahead, subjugated or murdered all the inferior apes, propagated his genes uh, and uh, started a new the new species so this super ape that you see waving his primitive axe about made out of an animal bone uh, he's killed the animal just because of the will desire to eat to murder to kill all good healthy things like that as Nietzsche sees it um, he's our great 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 grandfather um, now then just as there was one now in, sorry before I move on also implied in the movie scene is the other monkeys the inferior monkeys are not only totally frightened of the um, of the super monkey the one who gets ahead but they try and suppress him they try and mob him to, and all the rest of it but he uses his will and he throws them off and this is what Nietzsche thinks and it's clear in in Zoroaster where he's talking um, about the hour of great contempt that that if we're able to evolve, then some human will have to be the first superhuman, the first uberhuman, the not homo sapiens, but homo superior. That person will be reviled by all homo sapiens. They will say he's immoral, he's wrong, he's an awful, he must be suppressed. Because instinctively they will know that the superhuman will subjugate them and they will be toast in evolutionary terms, and the evolutionary wheel will have moved on, and they won't be part of it. So this is the, the system. Um, Zarathustra uh, is an evolutionary link to the future. So throughout the book, you will hear, you will see references mankind is a thing that must be overcome or humanity he says is a bridge between plants and um, spe uh, you know under species and there's this type rope there's the whole passage in the book about the the analogy of the tightrope walker you've got to walk over that type rope and on the other side of the type rope is not humanity but uh, the superman the overman the next stage in evolution so humanity is just this tightrope it, it's it's a temporary stage in evolution this is what this is an extraordinary idea a very mind-blowing idea uh, and it comes from uh, Zarathustra and uh, all, you know all science fiction apart from anything else is uh, powered largely by that this uh, rubbish film um, uh, with, um, this week it's it's grossed more money than anything else. What's it called? Avatar. I mean, again, it's just the same thing that the super evolution of a superhuman species conquering the universe, etc., etc. People who the scriptwriters who made that they all went to college. They probably went to art school. Nietzsche is much bigger in art school than universities. It has to it has to be said. 
and they received a lecture something like this, and they picked up um, Zarathustra, and they cottoned onto a couple of stanzas or verses in it, and uh, they uh, derived a script for their big film from it. I suspect. I don't know that. I've just made that up. Uh, it's not an unreasonable supposition. So, thus, the first super ape was the first human being. And importantly for Friedrich Nietzsche, this evolutionary leap forward had to take place in the personality of an individual being. Uh, whole groups of people can't evolve. Um, so any kind of collectivism, any kind of herd mentality, any crowd, any nationalism is not going to get us to the next stage of evolution. It's going to do exactly the opposite. It's going to pull us back. Um, so the Nazi idea that all Germans, that you know, Germans as a nation are supermen, you know, a higher men, over men, ubermensch, that doesn't fit with Nietzsche's system. Although individual Germans could be super people, and he thinks that there have been such German super people. One is Beethoven. Um, another one, perhaps, is Wagner. Although I think I think he fell out with Wagner and demoted him. Other super people in Europe, there's only been a few. There's perhaps one every hundred years or so or something. Napoleon uh, was a super person uh, who had within him the ability to bring about, you know, to single-handedly really abolish the Middle Ages, Christianity, all those systems of morality, to legislate for the whole of Europe, which at that time was essentially the whole civilised world, to completely change it just by his will, Napoleon. And Napoleon was brought down by all these mediocrities and uh, and so on. So um, Nietzsche was a great lover of Napoleon and the whole idea that I think he, he says in, in one of his books that it's worth enslaving the whole of France just to produce one Napoleon. This is the degree of his anti-democratic, elitist, aristocratic thinking. Alexander the Great was another superhuman, one of these super people from the future. Um, that's how it works. More in more in a more commonplace way, artists in general, people of higher sensibility, musicians, specifically composers of opera. Um, these people are not like you and I. They are like super monkeys from the future. And really, all we should do is be enslaved to help them do their super thing of inventing new types of music, new types of art, new types of science. The quicker we do that, and I suppose extinct ourselves, then the more we will be in line with the will. Thus spoke Zarathustra. So, humanity is a thing that must be overcome. Thus, thus spoke Zarathustra. Superhumans will emerge. I've mentioned uh, some of them, Jesus Christ, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, possibly Shakespeare possibly Wagner, artists generally. These people are always reviled because the common herd somehow senses that these people are going to destroy them, just as the super ape that became the first human killed off all the apes, or nearly all the apes. A few of them survive in zoos, and uh, but they've, they've now ceased to evolve because they are determined beings. So, you know, mankind can wipe them out tomorrow, just go and shoot them all. Um... So they're, they're not really evolving. Humans are not evolving naturally anymore anyway because of things like medicine. Um, it's literally the case that we're de-evolving in purely physical terms. I personally am an example of that. Um, I, When I was seven years old, I had a ruptured appendix because of appendicitis. Now, the appendix is... is a, genetic inheritance that is completely useless uh, and was dying out in the human species but n but now uh, um, and how it was dying out was that it would it would go bad and it would poison people age seven and they would die they wouldn't grow to maturity they wouldn't have children i've got a bad appendix it's in my genes i was saved by medicine i grew to maturity i've had two children they're carrying that gene so we are de-evolving as humans uh, a kind of frightening thought. Uh, however, um, 
when you look at European politics in the 20th century, in a sense, the left are, are reacting to this fact of human non-evolution by saying, well, now we have to evolve by scientific methods and intellectual methods. We can no longer evolve naturally, physically. Um, Nietzsche's right about that, whether they consciously cite him or not. So we can only move into a kind of future of space exploration and Carl Sagan and everything like that by building lots of universities, educating everybody and evolving intellectually. The political right, or at least the racist right, and the whole Nazi thing, the eugenic movement are saying, no, 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 no. We've now got to not save people like me who've got uh, genetic defects. Uh, we've got to kill those people, probably using euthanasia, and we've got to selectively breed super people. And this gets you into the whole Olympic Games, steroids, cyber, cybernetic people side of things. So either way, uh, humans are not evolving. We've got to do something about it. Either we can selectively breed ourselves in biological terms and you're sort of a Nazi, or you can evolve by becoming much more intelligent and listening to lectures such as this and going to university and reading books and discovering new elements and uh, exploring outer space. But you can't just stay where you are because eventually the, um, the super, uh, super cockroaches will take over. Um, so super people are always going to be resisted or killed. The way the herd, the herd don't like super person activity, they don't like modern art, they don't like anything elitist, they don't like anything difficult, and because it is only the next stage evolutionary proto super people who can understand modern art, modernist music, etc. Ordinary folks are not artists, they do not have the heightened sensibility of the artist super person. You can spot such genetic dead enders by the fact, for example, that they can't get any value out of reading also Spack Zarathustra. Uh, obviously Nietzsche has a vested interest in, in thinking that. So ironically, Frederick Nietzsche himself, though, was a physical weakling and an invalid. Um, he contracted syphilis at a fairly early point, and this disabled him. He was pretty much in a wheelchair, and the last ten years of his life he, sent in, he spent in an insane asylum. Uh, and there's a debate amongst Nietzsche scholars about this, about whether this was a deliberate act, because in following Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer's only refuge from the horror of existence and the evil of the life force, the only, there's only two refuges from this uh, for Schopenhauer. One is in the deep contemplation of art, when you're doing that, and the deep contemplation contemplation of art and especially art music and specifically well at least for for Nietzsche the opera of Wagner when you're in that Wagner in that state of listening to Wagner then you are not troubled by the horribleness of being and wanting and ego and all the rest of it and the only other place to go is madness you can deliberately embrace madness or perhaps Dionysian intoxication you can become a heroin addict or a drunk or something like that. That is a valid response to the problem of existence for both Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, either madness or the contemplation of art. But the ordinary, you know, live in the suburb, have a job is not really something that they're very keen on. Um, I'm just turning over my notes. Um, excuse me, just remember, I'm just looking for my notes. Here we go. Um, anyway, Zarath in, to get closer back to the text, Zarathustra decides to come down from the mountains and to go under. Now, apparently, this is a German pun. Uh, when you translate it, it means be buried alive, and at the same time it means surrender to morality, apparently. So the, there's a joke in there that, that, that living by ordinary morality of the great herd, the great mob, um, is the same thing as a kind of living death. So he, tr 
tries to go under and live again amongst the undermen. And on his way down from the mountain, halfway down, significantly, it's a joke, halfway between the mountain tops of the Uber Mensch and the and the the town of of the Undermensch, which is actually called Cow Town. It's it's called the Pipe the Spotted Cow is the name of, of the town. These people are just like ruminating cattle, the Undermensch. So but halfway down he finds somebody who's tried to be a super person. He's a moralist, um, a fellow hermit, and there's a long dialogue there in the prologue to Zarathustra of Zarathustra sort of arguing with this uh, moralist. What emerges from this is, is Zarathustra saying that Christian morality, or Jewish Christian morality, is um, just a way that the cattle people of the town uh, try and restrain anybody amongst them who's capable of higher sensibility and of genuine, authentic, artistic life. Um, if moralism fails to constrain the super people and artists, then the moralists will kill them, will kill the super person if need be. So it's morality is all about gentleness and compassion and kindness and love, but they will kill you if you go against morality. If you are like Socrates, um, you will be killed. If you try and live outside the moral code, you will be criminalized, you will be criminal. Um, and there's that, that line in there where Zarathustra says he's bringing fire, he's bringing light. And they say, no, 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 you, they, they will hang you for an art, you will be an arsonist. They fear that the fire will burn them. But that's obviously a reference there to Prometheus as well. Moralizing people in Zarathustra are to be despised. They're hypocrites. They're life deniers. They are very limited people. They're unimaginative. Women, we've already mentioned, are much more moralistic than men, and that makes them much more worse. But remember, we're talking here about Victorian moralism. Um, and maybe these days, why people are not so moralistic, and particularly on sexual morality, they're much freer up, perhaps, is part of the, the influence of Friedrich Nietzsche, either um, directly or by his all-pervasive uh, kind of seeping into the water table of just what everybody thinks these days normal. It's got a big Nietzschean existentialist element to it. So anyway, in, in the book, the moralist tells Zarathustra that the right thing to do, the purpose of life, is to protect the weak, to love people and to give people charity or alms. He uses the old-fashioned word, give alms. That's the point of life. Zarathustra says charity will corrupt the giver and the receiver. The moralist says they won't listen to that. They won't listen to you, Zarathustra. They'll just think you're a crazy old mountain man. They won't accept the gift of wisdom. There's no point. There's no point in trying to save these people. You may as well tell them what they want to hear, and you may as well be like me. Be like the moralist. Give them a handout. They don't want to know the horror of existence, like Schopenhauer says. They just want a handout. You may as well preach to the animals. Um, the moralist warns Zarathustra. Don't go down into the town and speak to the humans. Go and speak to the birds. Go and speak to the birds in the forest. You'll get... You know, you get they'll they'll appreciate it just as much as anybody else. Anyway, Zarathustra and the moralist agree to differ, but they are still friendly and they wander off in different directions. The moralist is apparently off to the forest where he is hoping to please God by humming tunes to the birds to make the birds happy. That's a very funny. That's a very funny thing. Um, that in all of creation, God wants people to be happy and contented. Uh, so the birds have to be happy, so the priest is going off to the forest to hum tunes to the birds to make them feel better. Then directly after this uh, funny thing about teaching the birds to sing, um, comes the famous saying, God is dead. He, he, when the moralist has wandered off, Zarathustra f starts thinking to himself, wait a minute, has, does the moralist still think that God is alive? 
Surely he can't believe that. Surely he must know that, that God died centuries ago. Um, so the, the, the phrase God is dead also comes from an earlier book, The Gay Science. Uh, but it, it, it's reiterated here in context. Anyway, Zarathustra ron wanders into the town and he interrupts it and he comes across a weird scene in the in the town square. All the cow people, the kind of ordinary people, um, they're being amused as usual by sort of stupid circus. Uh, and the um, the key thing in the circus is a tightrope walker. Uh, and it's a tightrope and yes, and now Zarathustra immediately annoys everyone uh, by coming on as a sort of nutter and shouting out and preaching to the people who are trying to watch the tightrope show. Um, you know, a bit like a sort of drunk in the, in, the, in, the, in the town, you know, the kind of people with dogs on strings, he's sort of shouting. And he's preaching about the overman to this, to this crowd. I bring you the overman, he keeps saying. Different translations give this as a superman. And Zarathustra tries to describe to the crowd what the overman is like and how to recognise him, how to be more like the overman. The overman is a clean ocean, he says, which will dilute the filthy stream of humanity. Humanity is a filthy and filthy stream of wretched contentment. It's a pollute, you know, the human race is a, is a polluted, uh, genetically degenerate, morally corrupt sewer, really. I suppose that's what you'd call a filthy stream. Uh, but don't worry, because one overman is like an ocean, and if this filthy stream empties itself into the overman, then it will be di diluted and disposed of. Then, as he's preaching to the crowd, What is an ape for a man? says Zarathustra. An ape for a man is a laughing stock, and so it will be for the overman. So the overman will regard humans as a sort of joke that he's evolved. So just as humans look at monkeys in zoos and say, wow, we used to be a bit like them, but now we just keep them in zoos and laugh at them, then the overman will take the same view of humans. So better book up your ideas and try and evolve into an overman. So the overman is described some more. The overman seeks to walk on the peaks of the mountains and fear nothing. He doesn't fear death. He doesn't fear tragedy. He finds tragedy to be hilariously funny. The overman always looks down on others from the actual meta or metaphorical mountain tops. He lives in the mountains. He dances. He doesn't walk. He never walks. He always dances. He could not worship a solemn, serious god. Thus spoke Zarathustra, a god that, that does not dance. I cannot worship a god that does not dance, says Zarathustra. The overman has joy in the face of death. And this reminds me of Roman military stoicism, uh, somewhat romanticised here. It's also Wagnerian, of course, in the sense that only, only warriors go to Valhalla. So death, violence, war, fear, danger, these are all the good. Uh, but Christian morality says that they are the bad. But without these things, how will evolution be possible? Religion is poison to the overman, thus spoke Zarathustra. He is faithful to the earth and not to other worlds or ghosts. Once the greatest sin was to sin against God, but God is dead. So these sins have died when God died. So if you accept that there is no God anymore, God died, then how can you possibly have an idea of sin? Sin is only disobeying the word of God. So if you're an atheist, there can't be any sin. Elsewhere in his books, he calls this the, re the transvaluation of all values, that without God, you have to re-examine every idea of what is a good thing and what is a bad thing, because it all came relative to God. Every single moral teacher, every philosopher, um, up to and including um, Kant, uh, derived their entire moral philosophy from God. 
Schopenhauer really is the first atheist, major, openly atheist. And then, of course, Nietzsche takes that on further into a kind of more militantly anti-Christian point of view. Self-control and reliance is the mark of the overman. Those who cannot command themselves will be commanded by others. Uh, so unless you determine other people, you will yourself be determined and therefore you won't evolve. Um, and that's a problem. Elsewhere in the book, it's, uh, elsewhere in that chapter, it says you must overcome yourself ten times a day. And this reminds me of Oriental martial arts practice or yoga. And, you know, something similar to Schopenhauer's view as well is kind of Hinduism of overcoming the, you know, the grubby desires of the self in order to simply exert self-control. So uh, Zarathustra gets to say all this and then the crowd begin laughing at them and say, get out of the way, you crazy old, crazy old mountain man, go away. Uh, we want to see the tightrope walker. And Zarathustra says, man is like, is not like the tightrope walker, but he is like the tightrope. He connects the beasts and apes to the overman. So mankind is a thing that must be overcome. What is great about humanity is that it's a bridge to the overman. And humanity is not an end in itself. It's not created by God for God's will and is not like that. It's just humans are just an evolving organism like bacteria or anything else. This line is a complete rejection of Kant's system of ethics, which had dominated the 19th century and in fact is still the basis of the do your duty type of morality, which still vaguely lingers on today. So the style of Zarathustra's speech in town is similar to the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, etc. Uh, but, and instead though, and so you'll see the style of that if you read it, it says, it's just these little sentences, each one is like a little poem in its own right, like, like a haiku as well, like a, like a, or like a Suf, the Sufis do this as well. They, they have these things like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And, and then you, that they just leave it at that and you're meant to react to it. So Zarathustra is standing in the town square. These people are trying to watch the circus. He's going on and on and on. He's berating them for just being useless and mediocre and not wanting to evolve. Uh, and um, and that they're in mortal danger, but they don't care. They they just want to watch the show. And then he's he's giving them this sort of strange sermon on the mount with all these strange mind bending sayings. Um, the foot, and then then we I've mentioned it already. Sorry, I went on about it earlier. But in this kind of weird sermon on the mount, that's the first mention of the last man. Now the last man is the most contemptible. The last man. It would be the last human that's alive in the sort of zoo uh, once whatever the next species has taken over. So he's the last man before the extinction of the human species. And, and Nietzsche thinks there will be a last man. One day there'll be a last man. I saw a, a recent British movie called Children of Men. And this was exactly th this whole film. It's quite a good film, I thought. But because I've read Zarathustra... I said, well, that's the last man. They've just taken the last man speech from Zarathustra and made a whole film out of it. And that was probably the biggest art, British art film in the last five or six years. Anyway, the last man will be domesticated. He'll have no connection with nature. His soil will not be deep enough to support trees. Um, he will have lost the spirit of chaos. He'll be very weak very meek, very unadventurous. He will no longer be capable of anything higher. He'd be like an old person on a, on a life support machine. And actually in the movie as well, 2001, uh, the final scene is like that. It's just this old man on a sort of life support machine in, in a very strange place. It looks like a sort of intergalactic zoo. He's in this sort of Palace of Versailles type room and he's totally feeble, totally weak, and he's the last man. 
Um, one must have chaos within oneself to give birth to a dancing star. So this is part of this weird counter Sermon on the Mount that Zarathustra gives. So without, you know, without this vitality, without this embracing of danger, change, chaos, you know, any the minute you you've given into kind of mediocrity, the the smooth path, then you're no longer capable of giving birth to a dancing star. But civil, so civilization is removing chaos from people, so it'll be no longer able to give birth to a child capable of evolving. The last man is unnatural, feeble, unable to evolve. So the type, and so anyway, the tightrope walker show goes wrong at this point. One of the performer falls off and smashes his body, and he lands right next to Zarathustra, where Zarathustra is preaching. He has failed to cross over the tightrope that is humanity. He has failed to become an overman. But you can't stand still forever. You see, you can't stand still on the tightrope. The minute the tightrope walker stopped trying to move from being an ape to being a superman, he fell off. So if you don't keep evolving, you will fall and you'll become mangled up and you'll die. And as he is dying, the tightrope walker says to Zarathustra that he fears he's going to hell now. But Zarathustra says, don't worry, there's no such thing as hell. Hell is something that's just invented by the moralists to, um, to give you the wrong reason for avoiding death. Uh, if you've been concentrating on trying to get across the tightrope instead of worrying about whether you're going to heaven or hell, then you would have been over the other side now, but now you're, all you're, you're, you're over. You're not going to hell. You're just, you, you're just a, you're a dead end. Nothing's happening. Uh, you're not going to contribute to evolution. So the tightrope walker says that in these, then, sorry, then the tightrope walker says then in dying he loses nothing at all and he dies happily. So Zarathustra, uh, in his nobility, uh, comforts the dying man by releasing him from the moralistic system of Christianity, which implies people go to hell. He says, don't worry, just die. There's nothing to worry about in dying. And the tightrope walker dies happily. In the same, in the same um, phase, Zarathustra points out that people are cows and they are like sheep. That uh, the intellectuals, the teachers and priests, they are shepherds. And they quite consciously call themselves that. That they, they look after the flock. And these shepherds arrive and they start the process of pointing the finger at Zarathustra. The ordinary people who are just watching the circus show don't really care, but they some somehow the priests, the teachers, the intellectuals, they've heard that there's a madman down in town and he's a lawbreaker, he's a destroyer. He's the most hated. He is the man who causes values to be re-evaluated. New values are written on new tablets of stone. That says Zarathustra. You'll gain companions. Destroyers, the, the, the new people, the super people, will be called destroyers. Destroyers they will be called, but they are not the destroyers. They are the harvesters. Never again will I speak to the people. Never again will I waste time speaking to the dead. To my goal, I will go in my own way. These are all phrases from this phase of the prologue. And finally, I'm reaching uh, the end of the prologue, um, the eagle and the serpent. The eagle and the serpent, these are my animals, the proudest and the wisest. Um, the eagle is the proudest, it's not defined, it lives up in the mountains, it kills, it preys on the weak. It's a, it's a kind of admirable, noble being. The serpent. Why does Nietzsche like the serpent? Well, he likes the serpent because this is the serpent of the tree of knowledge. The serpent is reviled by the Christians, but Zarathustra says the serpent should be worshipped because it was the serpent that told humanity to eat from the tree of knowledge. And it's only knowledge and knowing things.
things about this world that can save humanity. So that's a very, very profound, I think, inversion of Christianity, that all humanity's problems in the Christian system begin when this evil, evil serpent and the, and, and the Christians curse the serpent and it's a symbol of evil. But uh, for Nietzsche, the serpent is the symbol of everything that's good because it was the serpent that brought knowledge of the world to mankind. So there you are with the pre-Socratic uh, world that, that um, I was uh, describing because the serpent also the symbol of the pre-Socratic Greeks in the science of medicine, of uh, Hippocrates and the pre-Socratics. So there we are. So that, those are some observations just on the prologue and one or two other bits and pieces of Zarathustra. Tremendously difficult and hard book to read. Uh, very, very influential on uh, every single modern artist. The whole thing about, uh, you know, we live outside society, you know, every single art student, every single goth, every single uh, weird person, deviant person, anarchist, etc., etc., uh, coming very much within the tradition we've already discussed on the course of Rousseau, uh, the natural man uh, who can live by his own rules, not bound by morality, Christianity is bad, evolution is taking place, are you going to join the evolutionary train, or are you going to stay behind, mired in your nonsensical uh, Stone Age Christian nonsense? Um, so with those remarks, I will now stop persecuting you, and um, that brings this talk to an end. I might do another talk on Bertrand Russell's chapter on Nietzsche, uh, which uh, you should also read in conjunction with the book. Uh, and if you do that, uh, I think that that will be a very worthwhile thing. And we'll discuss uh, the book further um, in, in our seminar group work uh, later this term. Thanks for listening.